Ladies and gentlemen, no introduction is needed. You've seen the video. Now meet the man behind the video. Let's give a nice talk to Patty Walton. John D. You know, uh, it's just typical Buffalo fashion fans that before I came up and talked, a, a fan, one of the gentlemen here came up and gave me this, this green piece of paper. And on it it says, where would you rather be than right here, right now? <laughs> uh, I, I didn't realize there would be Jet fans and Dolphin fans here, but I... I must admit that it was a joy to play you too. So, I mean, <laughs> and there's only one person in here that I would not mess with right now. Where's Skyland? The girl that won the wrestling thing? Yeah, that girl. I mess with that girl. I know that. There she is. Yeah, adorable little kid. Uh, anyway, it is uh, a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I typically tell the whole story. My whole story takes about 45 minutes to an hour, but. He wasn't going to give me that much time, so I'm going to spend this 20 minutes with you, and I'm going to give you a little recaps and some of the, the most um, amazing parts of my story, because I can honestly stand here today and say I should have never been in the NFL. Um, not that I could, you know, wasn't good enough, because there's a lot of guys better than I was. I, I had a gift that can run, um, but I also had something that um, was instilled in me by my coaches and my hero, my dad. Um, was never given up attitude, and that was displayed in that play, which I'll, I'll end with that play, but for me, um, before I ever played a down in college football, okay, my NFL career started. Now, you might say, well, how does that happen? Well, this is how it happened for me. I was at Western Illinois, okay, and that was the only school that came after me to give me a scholarship in football, um, and I left it and for three years, I started working construction. I'm known as the siding man, aluminum siding. And so I did that for three years, and I felt led to go back to play college football. And, and the only team that would take me was Western Illinois again, three years later. And when I went back, I went through the spring drills, because every Division I program has spring drills. And um, I landed up earning the starting job. I only had one year of eligibility there. That's all I had. Um, and so this was it. Now, understand, when I went back, I had a passion and dream to play in the NFL. Boy, was I naive. Okay, but I, I felt my story is about faith first, family second, friends third, and then football. And so if I kept that perspective with faith, anything can happen. And so when I went back to Western during that, those spring drills, I landed up earning the start job, like I said. And... Towards the end of those practices was over, I was actually in math class one day. And I was in my usual college attire, tank top, jean shorts, and sandals. You know, just, just kicking it, right? And so every day I would walk out of this math class and I would walk around Western Hall and I'd go to my dorm room, eat lunch, and go to my next class. But this day I just happened to walk into the gymnasium, which was Western Hall. And when I walked into Western Hall, the indoor track, there were five NFL pro scouts there doing what they call pro days, like a miniature Indianapolis, uh, you know, the dome there when they had a big combine. So I walk up to coach and say, hey coach, what's going on? He goes, well, they're timing guys are going to be seniors, which at this point I was going to be a senior without playing it down, right? And he said, they're timing them in the 40 and doing some other tests for them. I said, man, I'd love to be able to do it. Can I do that? He looks at me, man, man, Don, he says, Let's not waste your time. I mean, you never played before. And I, mean, I, I said, man, I'd really like to play. I think it'd be kind of cool. And he goes, okay, well, he walks down there and he asks this, this scout with a big star on his chest. It was a Dallas scout. And, you know, big heavy guy with about five watches on his stomach, you know. They all look the same, you know. And I can hear them conversing about 40 yards away. And, and the Dallas scout goes, yeah, let him run. No big deal. So the coach comes back and says, yeah, they're going to let you run. 
I said, Coach, I got one more problem. No, what the? All I got is my sandals and I got jean shorts and I, are they going to let me warm up? No, Don, just get in line, kick off your sandals and, and run the 40. So I did. And so if you could have heard me pitter patter on that track, it was quite a scene. I pitter pattered to a 4 3 2 40. And when I got done, yeah, it was kind of funny because the, the Dallas Scott wasn't talking to anybody else, but when I got done, he was on a beeline for me. I mean, he, was, he came right over me and goes, What's your name? I go, Don Beebe. Don Beebe, what, what, Don Beebe? What number are you on film? Well, I'm a fifth year senior, I've never played before. He looked at me and started laughing. He goes, I've been doing this 21 years, son. He says, I've never timed anybody that fast on my watch. He showed me a watch and it was 432. And I said, Is that good? <laughs> I was so naive, I didn't know what was good or bad at that time. And he says, That's pretty good. So if I have one problem with my whole story, it's that a Dallas scout started my career. Because I hate Dallas. <laughs> I knew that would go over well. Um, and so I fast forward a, a, another year, and I was out of eligibility, like I said, and I went to this really small school, and that's what everybody knows me from, is Shatter State. The NFL Mecca. Uh, you know, Shatter State. You know, does anybody know where Shatter State is? Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, it's in Nebraska, all right? Now, when, they, when the coach called me, and the only reason I knew about Nebraska or Shatter is because the coach that recruited me out of high school in 83, which was five years previous, he was now the head football coach out there. So he comes and he calls me and he says, hey, would you come out here and play? And I was like, well, sure. So I went out there and played one year. And after that year, still, NFL teams were just, you know, form letters, maybe a free agent. But I still, again, felt that God was on my side. He really wanted this. As, you know, there are no odds with the Lord, right? So all of a sudden, at the end of that year, I was going to hopefully get drafted but there's a guy by the name of Bill Giles that came through town. Now, Bill Giles is an NFL combine scout. Not one team specifically, but he, his job is to go through the whole Midwest and, find, and help find the top 300 players in all of college football now because they get invited to the big show in Indy because the combine here is coming up here in another week or two. That's the big show. Well, how in the world is a guy from Shedron going to get invited to the big show? Well... He puts me through a workout, and to his dying day, he never told me what I ran. But it must have been pretty good, because at the end of it, he looked at me square in the eye, and he said, Don Beebe, he says, I've been doing this 32 years. That's the greatest workout I've ever put a guy through. And I said, thank you. And he said, I am going to give the NFL Combine Board my highest recommendation I've ever given any athlete. And I mean, this had to happen now. I'm saying, this is how God works, by the way. So anyway, a couple weeks later, I get this letter that has the NFL emblem on it that you've been invited to the 1989 February Combine in Indianapolis. So you talk about naive, out of tune. Man, I got on a puddle jumper. First of all, I rented a car to get up to Rapid City, puddle jumper to Denver, Denver to, to Midway, Midway down to Indianapolis to get there. I walk in with one bag, my Brett Favre uh, hat on, that's what it looked like then, and holy jeans and everything that I had, and my ASIC fishing shoes from high school. <laughs> so I walk into the Crown Plaza, and there's Barry Sanders, Deion Sanders, Troy Aikman, I mean, some of the greats of the 89 draft. Every GM, head coach was there. I wasn't even starstruck because I didn't even know better. Again, I was just so naive. So I walk in to the Crown Plaza, check in. My roommate's Mike Barber from Marshall University. And the door knocks. While we're conversing, the door knocks. I go to the door and it's the concierge. Now at that time I knew the concierge was French, but I didn't know what the concierge really was. But anyway, <laughs> he hands me these two orange shoe boxes, Nike shoe boxes, and he goes, This is for Mike Barber. And I said, Okay, so I took him to the mic and he goes, Like, what are those? He goes, Well, these are from my agent. Agent? You, you got an agent? What's an agent? He goes, You don't have an agent? I go, No, I didn't know I needed an agent. He starts laughing at me. You might be the only guy that doesn't have an agent here. And I said, okay. He says, is, what are you doing with those? He says, well, I'm going to run these in the 40. And they were these lime green track shoes, you know. He looks at me and he says, what are you going to run? <laughs> Looked down at my feet and I said, my old ASIC fishing shoes from high school. He says, you got to be kidding me. I said, yeah, those are it. And my only dilemma was this. I, and I took off my right shoe. And on my right shoe, half the sole of the shoe. Now, this is a dead serious true story now. was unglued. So every time I walk, it flopped. And when I ran, it really, really flopped. And so my clue was, do I 
band-aid it? Do I glue it? Or did I just rip the sole off? I didn't, I didn't know. Because he said, you can wear one of mine, but they were size 12. I was nine and a half. That'd be like Bozo Circus, you know? So, so I chose to flop. And it's still talked about today. I flopped to a 425 on that turf. Now, yeah. Um, and and I, I will say this. I don't say these things to really make me look. I'm just telling these things because these things had to happen. If these things would have never happened, I would have never played in the NFL. And so when I uh, ran the 425, it broke the all-time record. I typed that year with Deion Sanders, and that stood for 17 years until Chris Johnson broke it when he ran a 423. So my world turned upside down in a matter of moments. Okay, and so I get back to Shed, and there's the L.A. Raiders, at that time L.A., and the, um, uh, the Green Bay Packers were on my doorstep. I had to do 21 personal workouts. Next thing I know, draft day came up in the end of April, and I get the phone call, and it's Marv Levy. He goes, Marv, uh, Don Levy, uh, we just took you as a first pick in the 1989 draft. Now, I tell the whole story, and if you hear the whole story, it's amazing. That's why I stand here today at the age of 51 telling you there's no way I should have played the NFL. It was this guy's calling in my life. And so when I got to the NFL, I broke into the NFL in a very, well, unreal way. Okay, first game I ever get to play was in the Houston Astrodome. How many remember what happened? Okay, three. Great, I'm gonna fill the rest of you in, okay? <laughs> so I get into the huddle, first time ever in the huddle. Jim Kelly's calling plays, and, and it's a run play, a sweep away from him. And I go up to the right side, and there's Chris Dishman, a great corner, played about 12, 13 years of league. And he's right up in my face and saying, come on, white boy. He says, let's see it, man. I can hear you can run, man. I want to see this stuff. I'm scared to death, okay? <laughs> Now, he was being funny, and it wasn't a bad thing, but, if, you know, I got to know Chris, and it was a great, great relationship, but I was scared of this one, so it was a run play, get back, we don't make the first down, next time on the field, now it's third down again, because that was back when we didn't do the K-gun yet, I came in and every third down, so it's third down, and all of a sudden, it's a pass play, and I'm supposed to do a post corner, and as we're breaking the huddle, Jim goes, Beats, if Dishman's pressed on you, take him deep, I'm throwing it to you. Oh, right. So I'm running out there and dishing this up. He's coming right in my face. He's going, all right, white boy, man, I see nothing last play. He says, let me see something this play. Well, anyway, I got on top of him and, and beat him, and, and I turned around and looked, and Jim used to throw a really high ball, looked like a punt. It got, it got lost in the lights of the dome, and I literally stuck my hand out there, and it just stuck. And I kind of pulled it in, and I ran, and it was a 63-yard bomb touchdown, first play to ever go my way. That was a great way to break in. But that's not why I bring up the story. Is because the next time I get on the field, okay, it's another run play to the left side off tackle to Thurman, and I'm running out there, and all of a sudden Chris Dishman comes up and gets in my face, and he goes, dang, white boy can run, and backs up about eight yards. <laughs> So for me, obviously, the, the staple of my career is the Leon that I play, and as you saw on the end of the, on the tape there, you'll never forget that, that day. Uh, it was our third Super Bowl. It was just a beautiful summer day in Pasadena, California, a uh, place I always dreamed about when I was a little boy in the backyard, was playing in the Super Bowl in Pasadena, and here I am, I'm living my dream. And I go out there uh, about an hour before the game, and, and I'm going to give you the inside story of this, this deal here, because I'm in my, my shirt that I always wore, his pain, his, you know, his pain, your game. And, and I go out there and kneel at the 50-yard line, and I simply just said a prayer. I always prayed for every game, but this one was kind of special. And I just said, Lord, let me glorify your name today and not mine. And I, and I meant it with everything, every ounce that I am as a being. And when I got up, I felt so good. I mean, you ever, ever, you ever feel just really good? I mean, you've got a lot of athletes in here. And you just feel like, whew, throw me the ball, Jim. You know? Well, that's how good I felt. And I really thought I was going to score the winning touchdown for the First one in Bill's history in the back of the end zone, one arm stab, get both feet in the corner, and it would have been the play of the history, right? But no, God gives me the lead on that play. 52 <laughs> <laughs> 17, we're getting smoked, right? Now, I will say this that if I, and I truly believe this, that if I would have made that play, okay, I know many of you probably would have been a lot more happier, as would I have, but. I don't think that it would have near the impact that the Leon Left play has had on people across the country. I, for one, can tell you, I, by the thousands, still 23 years later, every day, 
I get somebody writing me something across, the, across this globe, most of them in the United States, that tell me, thank you for making that play. Be it a little kid or a coach or a teacher. But the ones that really I love the most is moms and dads, especially the dads. And I just love reading those letters. Some of them bring me to tears. And because and, they're just pouring their hearts out, you know, in these letters. And, and I sit there and think, man, what a, a simple play in football can be such an impact on people. It's crazy. But yet, I realized then and there, and I hadn't known this before, but it really sunk home. I didn't play in the NFL for me. I played in the NFL for you. I played in the NFL for him and to glorify him just like I prayed, and that's exactly how he answered it. And so when I saw that ball, I was literally running a fly pattern down the left side of the field, and I saw the ball fumble. And I saw a big giant of a man pick it up. All of a sudden, when he started running, bam, I just took off. And here's the first lesson that I teach, especially kids and people in general, is that really how you react to something is really your true character. Because see, Mark used to say this all the time, and he's so, so spot on. Every game you play, no matter what sport you play, your character will be revealed at some point in time, good or bad. The question is, is how are you going to do it? How are they going to reflect on you? And so because of my dad, my hero, never giving up, was not, giving up was not even an option in my house. When my coaches, giving up was never an option. So it was just ingrained in me. That's not something you can think about in one night. Oh, this Super Bowl, I'm going to go in and never give up. It's just ingrained in you who you are as a person. And so I just took off. I reacted the right way because I didn't know any better. So I started running. And I'm running right in front of the Dallas bench. And everybody that in the across the country always wanted to ask me this question. What were you thinking? Well, literally, I was thinking as I run in front of Jimmy Johnson, I'm thinking, how am I going to tackle this 300-pound huge man? <laughs> I was just going to jump on his back. He'd have me right out of the back of the end zone. It would have been a football folly instead of what it came. But, but Leon started to strut with about eight yards left. And he stuck the ball out, as you know out to his right. Little did he know that there's this little pipsqueak of a guy, down to be coming down and knock that ball out. And I knocked the ball out of his hands, just inside the one yard line, as you know. So if I'd have thought about it for just one second, I'd have never made a play. But I took off. And then after that, I literally went over to the, to the sideline, ticked off, because we're getting beat 52-17. And I go into the locker room, and where, really when it started hitting home to me is when the owner of the Buffalo Bills passed right by Jim Lock, Jim's locker and came right to mine. And I had my head down, and I could tell it was those brown loafers here he always wears. And I looked up, and as Mr. Wilson said, son, he didn't call me 82, Don, Don Beebe or nothing like that. He said, son, he said, you showed me a lot today. He said, you showed what Western New York and the Buffalo Bills are all about. Thank you. And from that point on, I knew it had an impact on at least him. And then I get back to one bill drive, and man, it was a hundreds and hundreds of fan mail letters every single day by the boxes. And the big joke was I was getting way more, 10 times Jim Kelly. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing that I want to teach kids, especially the athletes in here tonight, is that if Leon would have ran as fast as he could, and Don Beebe would have still knocked that ball in Leon's hand, nobody would have said anything to Leon left. But my life changed, and so did Leon's. His for the bad, mine for the good. Now, the nice thing about it, I've gotten to know Leon over the years, and, and to be honest with you, he's a good man. He's a good guy. And he's using the same play, just coming from a different angle than I do, but we're teaching the same story to kids. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Giving up is not an option. Because if you give up, I can tell you the answer. You'll lose. If you don't give up, I can also tell you the answer. You will lose then too at times, but you'll win a lot more. And if when you win a lot more, you can start to build your legacy and your story so you can stand maybe on a stage one day or in front of your team or in front of your parents and maybe make a Leon Lett play just in your high school team or your college team and then be able to tell us the story of never giving up. People, I gotta tell you, it is an absolute joy for me to come back to Western New York with Buffalo Bill fans because you guys are the best. And I will say this, I've won a Super Bowl with the Green Bay Packers and I've gone to four to Super Bowl and I don't say this because I'm in front of Bill's fans, I'll say this anywhere, anytime. If I could go back 
And I'm not one to look back. I'm always looking forward. But if you would ask me, if I could go back in time, where would you go? There'd be no better time than the early 90s in Buffalo. Thank you.